The President, please be seated. The court is now back in session. Before we hand over to the co prosecutor, the Chamber would like to inform counsel for Mr. Kilsom Pond to submit the waiver of Mr. Kilsom Pond to the Grefje of the Trial Chamber at the earliest convenience. And at the same time, AV booth officers are now instructed to ensure that the AV equipments are very well linked to the holding cell where Mr. Kilsom Pond can observe the proceedings from there. I would like now to hand over to the co-prosecutor to proceed with the questions. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Mr. Goodness, you, you'll be happy to know that, I, that I've finished the questions, the detailed questions about where the leaders were located and the periods they were. I appreciate you, you bearing uh, with me on, on that. I know that's uh, some very uh, uh, detailed uh, questions. Um, I want to turn now to the period that you worked uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And uh, what I'd first like uh, to ask you is you indicated that you started working on preparations uh, for the ministry um, starting in May of 1975. When did the, when did the ministry begin operations? Response. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as already mentioned, started uh, in May, two, uh, rather 1975, uh, when Om Ying Sari came back from abroad because from May 1975 onwards, uh, the Ministry had uh, received guests on a weekly basis. There was no official announcement, but I was in charge of arranging the guest house or the place where we received guests. I was in charge of catering services and I already was deeply engaged in my tasks commencing from the 5th, rather from May 1975. And by late 1975 or early 1976, the Ministry B1 was established. You just made a reference to B1. Was B1 the code name uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Response. Yes, it was. That's the code name for the Ministry. And uh, for the section in charge of receiving foreign guests. And can you tell us what your uh, position was at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Response. I was the head of the B1 administration section, overly in charge of administration. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what your areas of responsibility were uh, as the head of administration uh, for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? response I 
already stated I was the head of B1 office. I was overly in charge of psychologically and politically controlling or administering the people there and also this section supervise other parts of the country like section in uh, Sihanouk, Serai Sopuan, Bat Dambong, Kampung Cham and Kampung Chnang. There were branches um, where guest houses were established to receive guests. During the time that you worked as the uh, head of administration, uh, who was your superior? Who, who was the uh, superior to whom you reported? Response. Om Eyang Sari was the overall a person who overly in charge of uh, the place. And was he the highest ranking official at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Bye. Response, yes. Can you uh, identify for us uh, some of the other um, uh, cadres who uh, had uh, managerial responsibilities at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and reported to Ng Suri? Uh, can you identify us who the other um, uh, section heads were at the ministry? Response. There were different sections. For example, for the diplomatic section, Mr. Tuan was in charge. For the kitchen section, Sin was in charge, and for political affairs, So Hong was the man in charge. How many uh, uh, people in total uh, worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Response. By late 19... 78, there were up more than 1,000 people working there. Going back to, the, to when the ministry was established, uh, can you tell us uh, how the personnel uh, were selected to work at the ministry? Response At the cadre level, Office 870 
was in charge of selecting people to work at V1. And for personnel who worked in the ministry, Om Ying Sri was the one who advised and recruited and I was the one who had to implement uh, to uh, the instruction or to advise or instruct uh, people to work at uh, the kitchen and elsewhere concerning administration. Uh, Mr. President, at this time I'd like to uh, provide the witness with uh, uh, a, a copy of his first uh, interview with the investigating judges, which is a document E3-24, uh, uh, originally previously in the case file as D91-10. And I wanted to ask him uh, about a, a couple of passages from that. Um, the uh, um, specific passages that I'm going to ask him about first uh, is at English ERN 00223583, Khmer ERN 00204070, and French ERN 00503923. Uh, 923. Um, so, if I have permission to provide a copy to the witness and put that uh, uh, document on the screen. The President, you may proceed. Uh, court officer is now instructed to bring the hard copy of the document to the witness for examination. Mr. President, may I request the prosecutor to repeat the ERN in French because what I have does not correspond to um, what he must have said. Uh, yes, I'm happy to do that. The French ERN is 00503923. Excusez-moi, ça ne correspond pas avec les. I crave the court's indulgence. That uh, reference does not correspond to any of the statements given by the witness. Could you please, therefore, give me the page of the other version in English? That would enable me to find the page. The page. Thank you. The President, uh, Counsel for the Civil Parties, you may now proceed. As far as I am concerned, the ERN in French is correct, and it is page 7. Perhaps that would help my learned friend. Thank you, says Council. The President, uh, thank you very much, Council. Mr. Co-Prosecutor, you may now continue. The uh, passage... Uh, uh, from your interview, I would like to direct you to uh, Mr. Witness, uh, reads as follows, uh, quote, At Borakila, there were people from every zone. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs had the right to choose its people directly. Other ministries also went to Borakila to select. Office 870 had selected them from the zones, and at the Foreign Ministry, uh, Ing Suri was the person who designated the selection, first by the class, second by the qualification, and third, persons from old revolutionary bases. And my first uh, follow-up question on this is, um, you've stated that Office 870 
uh, selected people from the zones and brought them to Borakila, and that the ministries then selected personnel from that group. Uh, can you tell us, uh, first of all, what Office 870 is? When you referred to Office 870, what were you referring to? Response. Office 870 was in charge by Bang, who received instructions from Om Pol Pot. And this office communicated with other zones. For example, how many people would be needed uh, by um, the ministry, then Pang would be the one who, uh, who helped select uh, these people. Um, did you uh, participate in selecting the people uh, from Boraikila uh, who were then assigned to work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? response yes i also was personally engaged in the process can you tell us approximately when it was that you went to boraikila um, to select people to work at the ministry of foreign affairs Response. It was starting from the year 1977. Response. Before 1977, it was the Office 870 who selected the people and uh, sent them to me and my section to uh, further arrange. Just so I'm clear, so you, you're saying it was only starting in 1977 that you were able to go to Boraikila and select people yourself. Is that right? Response, yes, it is. Now, in the passage uh, that I read from your interview, um, you uh, indicated uh, that uh, Ing Suri uh, had provided uh, some criteria uh, for selecting those personnel. Um, how did he communicate those criteria to you? Response. It, he instructed and referred to the written documents, and he verbally told me about that, and he said that the recruitment had to um, follow the instructions as uh, stated in the written documents. Where had these written documents come from? Were these Ministry of Foreign Affairs documents or were, there, were they documents that came from somewhere else? Response. These documents uh, were from Office 870. Uh, 
Kim, you indicated in your uh, testimony to the investigating judges that the first criteria that you were instructed to look at for selecting personnel was their class, their class background. Um, uh, what class backgrounds were you told um, were required in order to select personnel to work at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Response. When it comes to class pedigree, it refers to the people from poor peasant class, people who had never been affiliated with any groups. They had been doing farming um, uh, on some very very difficult land to uh, farm. Were, were you told why, uh, why it was important that people who be appointed come from uh, a poor peasant class? Response. Through study sessions, poor peasant class and worker class were regarded as the core forces of the revolution. And uh, this um, statement was substantiated uh, in the study sessions materials or confirmed in, in, in those uh, materials. And when you went to Borakila to um, select people to work at the ministry, um, how did you know what their class background was? Uh, had they been required to prepare biographies, or uh, were you required to uh, question uh, these people? The President, uh, Mr. Witness, could you please hold on? International Co-Counsel for Mr. Ying Sari is on his feet. He may now proceed. I know these are hyper-technical, or at least it may seem to be technical, but why can't we just ask this, the simple question as opposed to then going on and giving a smorgasbord of options from which to choose? How, how was it determined? And let the witness. It just seems it's leading all the way. Now, if we're not going to do it right and we're going to lead, let's lead and allow us to lead as well. But I think it confuses everything, and I understand that this may be a, uh, a technique that they find amusing, but I certainly don't think it is amusing, and I think it, this is the wrong approach. No, Mr. President, there's nothing leading about the question. The, w the witness can tell us and there's nothing wrong with asking him whether these witnesses had biographies. Um, so I, I do not think this is an appropriate objection. This witness is certainly able to tell us uh, the answer uh, uh, to this. There's in, in no way have we suggested or fed him an answer as to this question. The President, the objection by the Council for Inquiry was not substantiated and therefore not uh, sustained. Witness is now instructed to respond to the question if you still remember. If you don't, uh, International co-prosecutor is now advised to repeat the question so that witness can clear, 
fully understand the question and respond accordingly. Um, Mr. Witness, would you like me to repeat the question or do you, do you remember it? My pardon. Witness, uh, it would be better if you repeat the question, please. So my question to you was, when you arrived at Borakila, uh, how did you know uh, um, the uh, class background of the people who, who were there, who you had to choose uh, to be at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? Response. At uh, Burikila, there were summary of biographies that kept there, and we had to contact the people who kept the documents. Then we would uh, call the person whose name appeared in each respective biography and uh, have it checked against the guidelines as uh, instructed in the documents. If the person's biography matched the description, then they would be selected uh, to work for B1. Indeed, people who selected to, uh, for B1 would also be um, poised to work abroad. We, need to, we needed to look at people who had uh, proper physical appearance, like well-built, tall, for that purpose. Thank you. I'd like to turn to another subject now. Um, um, during the time that you worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, was one of the uh, functions for which you were responsible uh, the delivery of letters or other documents um, from uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to other persons and organizations? Were you responsible for delivering documents? Response. I'm afraid uh, I do not quite get the question. Could you please uh, repeat it? Dur during the uh, time you worked at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, was one of your responsibilities uh, delivering documents for Ing Suri? Sir, you refer to the documents transmitted to Insari. Of course, if there were other documents from other offices, those documents will be transmitted to Insari. And I myself had a personal discussion with him regarding the staff selection. For example, how many staff have been selected for this zone or that zone? And if it agreed, then that a process would move ahead. I think there was either a problem in the way I asked the question or the tra translation, so let me try again. Um, what I was asking you about was whether you were responsible for uh, delivering letters or other documents that Ing Suri had prepared and wanted delivered to other persons. Answer. Uh, 
any documents that he asked me to deliver through Office 870, I would do so. I would deliver them to the head of Office 870, uh, that is uh, to Pong. Were there other persons or offices uh, to whom you uh, delivered documents or letters um, from Ing Suri in addition to Office 870? Answer. Regarding the delivery of documents from Ian Sari to others besides the Pol Pot, it was not uh, frequent. If the documents or letters need to be delivered uh, through the basis, all those letters had to go through Office 870 then that office would disseminate those letters to the basis. We did not deliver the, those uh, messages or letters directly to the basis. It had to go through Office 870. Well, uh, let me take you through uh, um, uh, various people and groups. Um, uh, did you deliver documents from Ing Suri to Pol Pot? If he assigned me to deliver a document to Pol Pot, then I did. But actually, they worked together, and basically, they would uh, contact each other personally because usually in the evening uh, they would gather all together. Um, Mr. President, um, I'd like to, at this time, uh, refer the witness to another section of his uh, interview uh, with the investigating judges and then ask uh, some uh, follow-up questions to that. Um, this is, again, a document E3-24, uh, the uh, same interview uh, that we provided to him a few moments ago. And the passage uh, that I'd like to ask him about is that uh, Khmer ERN uh, 00204 071, English ERN 00223 and French ERN 00503 923 through 503 924. Uh, and if we may have permission to put that on the screen also. President, yes, you may proceed. Uh, the uh, uh, section of your uh, interview that I wanted to ask you about, um, Mr. Witness, um, reads as follows, quote, the courier worked in the foreign ministry. Uh, whatever needed to be delivered to Pol Pot and the other ministries, I was the person in charge of taking it to senior ministry leaders, including Pol Pot and Son, and Son Sen. Sometimes I waited for written or oral replies uh, to take back. Uh, end of quote. And uh, I understand what you just told us, which is that Pol, Pol Pot and Ing Suri uh, work together. Um, but when you were asked to deliver documents or letters from Ing Suri to Pol Pot, um, where would you go? Where would you go to uh, bring Pol Pot a letter?
answer, as I just stated, if there was a document or a letter from the ministry, and if Mr. Insari was to assign it to me to deliver to Pol Pot, I would just uh, do that. Or to Sun Sen, I would do the same, or to uh, Von Wait. It was the same procedure for these people as well as uh, for Kills and Pawn. That was how it's done. Did you personally uh, deliver letters to Ings, I'm sorry, to Pol Pot uh, and Son Sen, or would you deliver them to one of their uh, assistants? Answer. Based on the instruction from Yung Sari, if I was to deliver to the assistant, then I would uh, do that. If I had to deliver to him personally, then I would deliver to him personally. Where was San Sen located? Where was it that you would go to deliver a letter? If you were asked to deliver a letter to Son Sen, can you tell us that? Answer. Regularly, Son Sen would stay at the Ministry of Defense. However, the Ministry of Defense was adjacent to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And the same question for Pol Pot. If you were asked to deliver a letter from Ming Siri personally to Pol Pot, where, where would you go? To what office? Answer. If it depends on the instruction from Ying Sari, if he if he told me if he t told me that I had to take it to Pol Pot at uh, K3, then I would deliver deliver to K3 or a K1, then I would deliver to K1 or the Silver Pagoda. That was based uh, or it it depended on the instruction from Om Ying Sari. Okay, thank you. Uh, on the same page um, uh, of your uh, OCIJ interview, um, you also provided the following answer. Um, the question was, uh, do you remember taking messages from Ying Siri to Q Sun Pan? Answer, there were many, like when preparing for visitors before travel uh, down to the zones. And uh, the same question I want to ask the same question about Q Sam Pan. When you would deliver letters from Ing Suri to Q Sam Pan, um, where is it that Q Sam Pan was based? Where was it that his office was located? Answer. I used to deliver letters to accuse some pawn, and his office was uh, located at uh, Office K3. Basically, he stayed at Office K3. Did you also deliver letters to Q Sampan? at Office 870. 
answer. Office 870. Actually, Office K3 or K1 was still part of Office 870. And sometimes I delivered the letters to both offices, that is K1 and K3, which were part of Office 870. Now, in, in the answer uh, I just uh, read to you from your interview, um, you indicated that one of the times uh, that uh, Ing Suri and Q Sampan exchanged correspondence uh, was when preparing for visitors or before travel uh, down to the zones. Um, were there occasions where Ing Suri and Q Sampan traveled together to the zones? Uh, usually the exchanges of uh, messages occurred when there was a, a delegation visiting the country. For example, there was this uh, delegation visiting uh, Kampung Cham and uh, Prey Wang. And he communicated with Q Sampon in order to inform the zone to receive the delegation. But uh, Q Sampon did not go, only Ying Sari went with the uh, that delegation, that is the delegation of uh, Sung Yong Kui. Did, uh, did you travel with Ying Sari when he would go to the zones? or provinces? That's a, yes, I did. And how often did Ing Suri travel uh, to the zones or visit the zones? As I recalled, when there were my delegations or diplomatic call, then he would go, but it was not that often. When you traveled uh, with Ing Suri to the zones, were you able to observe the condition of the people who were living there? I made my observation during my trip with him. What I observed was that the people along the way that I travel, they Outward appearance was not that pleasant. Uh, they looked tired as they had to build dams and dig canals. And in uh, certain places, they only had gruel to eat. Thank, thank you for that uh, response. Um, now, in, in the, uh, the first passage I read to you from your interview about uh, delivering documents, um, you indicated that sometimes you waited 
for written or oral re replies to take back. Um, do you recall uh, occasions uh, when you delivered a document for Ingsuri and received a, waited and received a response back? And can you tell us who, who it was that would provide responses to Ing Suri in response to his letters? Um, answer as I recall. If the letter was to be sent to Pol Pot, Pol Pot would read the letter, annotate it, and the letter would uh, be sent back. In the case of Kissam Pon, a similar case uh, have happened, and also likewise with uh, Nun Chi and uh, Son Sen. On a regular basis, those people would annotate the letters and the letters will be delivered back to him. I want to turn now to uh, some more questions about uh, Office 870. Um, your uh, interview uh, with the uh, investigating judges uh, document E3 slash 24. Uh, if you look on uh, Khmer page 00204071, uh, which is English page 00223584, and French uh, page 00503924, uh, I want to direct you uh, to the following uh, question and answer. Um, question, uh, did you personally hand letters to Q. Sampan? Answer, yes, I took them to Q. Sampan, telephoning him in advance. Mostly, I met him personally, and when I did not meet him, I placed them on his desk. Office 870 was located in the current Russian embassy. Um, the, when you refer to an Office 870 that was located in the current Russian embassy, was that part, uh, was that the same location as Office uh, K1, or was that a different office or different building? Can you tell us that? I already made uh, some statements regarding Office 870. The Office 870 where Kizampon stayed would be both at K3 and K1. These were the two locations where I had contact with him. And yes, uh, before I went to see him, I would uh, telephone him in advance. And if he was not there, then I would just press uh, the letter on his desk. Can you tell us where the K1 office was located and where the K3 office was located? Currently, I cannot recall the location of K3. The landscape has completely changed. It's been more than 30 years. It was along the embassy compound. Uh, there were the Laos embassy, the Cuban embassy, the Yugoslavian embassy, and uh, K3 office was uh, located in that vicinity. As for K1 office, it was located along the river bank of uh, Basa River. Who 
who uh, was the uh, chairman of Office 870? Answer. Initially, it was uh, Bong Pong, who was the chairman. And after Pong disappeared, Dun was in charge. And after the disappearance of Dun, it was Om Kusum Pong who was in charge. Was there a division of responsibilities at Office 870 between administration and policy matters? Answer. Whatever matter related to the case of visiting the zones or at the designated locations, they would have to contact Office 870. Let, let me read to you another uh, 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 excerpt from your interview. And then I'd, I'd like you to explain what you meant uh, by this answer. Um, it's the same document, and it is at Khmer ERN 002040 071, uh, English ERN 00223584, and French ERN 00503924. Uh, and the uh, uh, statement of yours that I'd like to ask you about um, it reads as follows, quote, the person in charge of Office 870 was Pong, the chairman. When Pong was gone, Doin came to replace him for a period, and still later on there was Kusum Pan. Pong was in charge of 870 administration, and Doin was in charge of policy. Like at B1, where Hong had the policy and I had the administration. Can you explain to us um, what you meant by this distinction between administration and policy? I'd like to clarify this point when it comes to the distinction between the policy and the administration. In terms of uh, policy, it means that as he was a member of the Office 870, he will be in charge of uh, chairing the study sessions for the cadres. But for the administration, it would deal with the day-to-day -day task, who had to go where, so on and so forth. And that would fall under the shoulder of the one in charge of the administration, also when it comes to travels to various zones. How did you um, come to learn about Pong and Doing's respective responsibilities at Office 870? Answer. 
to respond to your question. And as I stated earlier, Dune was dealing with the uh, policy. He would have the study sessions in various uh, sessions to teach about the uh, policy. For example, there will be a session for 100 participants or for a group of 50 participants based on the necessity. And that's how it was uh, operation, operational. And the same thing applied when I was at B1, where Bong Hong was in charge of a policy, policy or of the study sessions. And I had to deal with the administration, with the housing, with the kitchen issues, and with the reception of the guest and with the uh, guard task. That was part of the administration. Um, you told us uh, a few minutes ago that after Doin disappeared, that uh, Ku Sampan uh, was in charge. Uh, how did you, do you recall um, when, uh, when it was that Doin disappeared and Ku Sampan uh, took over his responsibilities? Answer, as I recall, it was probably in mid-1978, or oh, it was around that time. How did you learn uh, that Doin had disappeared and that Q Sampan had taken over from him? How did you become aware of that? Answer. I learned it. Uh, I learned of it uh, through Om Insari. He said, Bong had been transferred, and he w he had been replaced by Dun. And upon the disappearance of Dun, he said, Dun will be replaced uh, by Kissam Pond, and Kissam Pond was the one who I had to. Com contact or communicate with. Did you ever talk to Q Sampan himself about his uh, responsibility at Office 870? Answer. I did ask, ask him about his uh, responsibility because uh, I was wondering, because I had to communicate uh, with him. And what, what did he tell you? Answer. I cannot recall the details, but I, uh, of course, I can recall uh, some main points. For example, in regards to visitors going to the zones, and when I have the, the letters uh, to him, then he would uh, send or transmit uh, that uh, letters to the zones, and that I could go ahead with the arrangement for the guests to visit the zones. The President, uh, thank you, Mr. Witness, thank you, the uh, prosecution. The time is now appropriate for the adjournment.
we saw recess for today's adjournment and resume on Monday the 30th starting from 9 a.m. We then will continue to hear the witness, the testimony of the witness, Ru Chiam Ton, and continue to be questioned by the prosecution. Mr. Ru Chiam Ton, your testimony has not yet concluded, and you will be required to be present next Monday, the 30th of July 2012. And you need to be present in this courtroom on that day. Likewise, the duty counsel, you are required to be present on Monday. Court officer, to assist, please assist the witness to return to his uh, place of residence and have him returned next Monday at 9 a.m. Security guards, you are instructed to take the three accused back to the ECCC detention facility and have them back in the courtroom on Monday the 30th of July 2012 before 9 a.m. In the case of Mr. Ying Sari, you need to bring him to this courtroom. The court is now adjourned.